Well, hey, welcome to Liverpool One Church today online. We are so grateful to connect with you guys, right? Yeah, it's so good that you've decided to join us. And hey, like we've said before, the 10 a.m. is the Come new on. time to party. It's the best time. It's the best time on a Sunday. But hey, we want to just say welcome if you're here for the very first time. If you're tuning in, we just want to yeah. say, hey, we appreciate you guys. We are sending some virtual love, virtual some high hugs. fives, some virtual hugs to you guys today. Hey, let us know who you are. Message it in the chat. One of our welcome team would love to say, hey, but it's great that you're here, right? Definitely. And hey, today we want to honour two groups of people. And the first group is you parents out yes. there. Guys, you are doing an amazing job. We just want to say from Liverpool One Church that we love you. We're proud of you. Hey, this is a difficult time. It you're is, homeschooling. Homeschooling, trying to work whilst look after kids. I mean, I don't know how that works. We don't have to homeschool. Clara's only 12 months. She's I feel blessed okay. in some ways. But the second group we want to honour is all of our teenagers, all of yes. our kids, all of you guys trying to just make school happen from home, from Zoom, whatever you're doing. Hey, it's a hard season, but we appreciate you guys and we hope that you guys are doing well. Yeah, we do. And hey, you youth, we have so much stuff going on in the weekday, so our youth leaders are missing you. So I hope you're tuning into that as well as online church. And Powerhouse, every Sunday, yep. they have contact. Nathan I love is it. dancing every I, Sunday. I love it. I love following Lenny. Will Kale is an amazing dancer on Powerhouse. You should check it out after this for sure. But hey, that's enough of us rambling on. Today, we have an amazing service lined up for you guys. So sit back, relax, get a cuppa, and welcome to Liverpool One Church. Liverpool One Church, we have a new song for you today and we would love it if you joined with us. So come on, let's worship. I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yes, my prayer This is my testimony from dead to life Cause Christ rewrote my story, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony
hey, hey, Liverpool One Church, it is so great to have you with us, joining us for service uh, online today. And we know, we get it, right? We would all love to be here in person, all gathering, and right now that's not possible. But the fact that we get to gather and meet online in every single one of your homes, just like homes all over, not only this nation, but further than that, is just absolutely incredible. And we just want you to know, like from the off, from the jump, that you're incredibly welcome here. And you're going to be joining us for week three of our current series that's called Walk This Way. Now, we've been talking over the last number of weeks just about this whole idea about how Jesus gives this this incredible invitation, which when you think about it and when you really look into it, it's a little bit mind-blowing, or at least I think that it is, which is whereby we've got this one and only Son of God that's been given by our Father in heaven to put on flesh and walk amongst the earth. And He walks up to ordinary, regular people just like you and me and He says to us, come and follow me. And what He's doing really is He's given us an invitation for us to walk this way. In other words, He's saying, look, you don't always have to do life the way that you've always done it, there is, there's an alternative that's available. There's another option that's on the table. There's another offer that's available to you. He says, walk this way. And today we're gonna be continuing in this theme and looking at one of the ways that Jesus gives us an option of doing life that might be a little bit different to how we ordinarily look at life and maybe even think what Christianity is actually about. I don't know about you, but when I was in school, I had, um, there were some guys that I really loved and I hung out with and they were like my best friends. And then of course, there's some other guys that you kind of, you don't really love to be in their company and it can feel a bit awkward when you're around them. And one of the things that I learned from school is maybe similar to one of the things that you've learned from school. And that was that, that school life was way easier when it was done with your friends. Like when it was done with your mates. For the guys, when it's done with the boys. For the girls, when you just walk in doing life with your girlfriends, like life is just better. And one of those things that you learn in school is actually the same thing that's carried through into adult life too, because the same principles apply. Like your life is just better when you do life with the right people. You know, when I was about 15, I remember this one time that I was in my business studies class and the teacher there was scary. I mean like whole nother level of scariness. She was called Mrs. Sharp and um, she was scary for, for a number of reasons. I wasn't too sure whether it was because she had a beard or she had summer teeth, you know, kind of like summer black, summer brown, summer missing. I don't really know what was most scary about her, but she would like freak me out and she would rule that class with a rod of iron. Like if you ever did anything and you were caught, man, you would pay for it. I remember this one day I was in this class and um, I just happened to do one of those things that us boys sometimes do, which is you shout out something that's completely stupid, not related to anything else that's going on in the class. And it made a bunch of other people laugh. And I really felt great about myself until Mrs. Sharp got on to the end of what was happening and she was not impressed. And she waltzed right over to where my desk was alongside my best mate, Tyson. And she literally, she started to shout at us both. Who was it? And with every shout, she started to get closer. That's right. The black and brown and missing teeth, the beard, the scary eyes, the loud and increased raising voice. She would just get closer and closer and she'd scream, who was it? Wanting to know who was it that had been shouting something stupid in and around the class. And then for some reason, you know, I did this thing where you kind of like, you hold your breath because everybody knows, right? If you hold your breath, when you're being shouted at by your teacher, that's like a secret hidden signal. So your teacher knows that you're not responsible for whatever it is that she's accusing you of. So she went round to my best mate, Tys, and she started to get right in his face. And she's like shouting at him, was it you? And he's just like looking at his computer monitor, not even daring to turn left or to the right, daring not to make eye contact with her. And she's, he's like, no miss. And then she gets louder and more and more aggressive. And she's like, was it you, you disgusting child? And I'm sitting there shaking. And he's like, no miss. Because technically what he was saying was completely truthful. It wasn't him. Now, if I was a really good friend, what I I should have done was done the right thing. You know where you kind of go, miss, like stop shouting at Tice. It, It wasn't Tice. It was me that said the stupid thing. 
But I did what every boy in the class would have done. I stayed perfectly silent as she started to just heckle him, get right in his face and then sent him out of the classroom. And all along he was protesting with the utmost strenuous ability that he had within him to say, it was not me, miss. And I just kind of look back on that moment and go like that right there is such a sign of friendship. I mean, he was taking one for the team that day. I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie. I had zero confidence, zero bottle to be able to admit to that teacher that I was in the wrong. But in that moment right there, like our friendship was cemented for life. I mean, here's the crazy thing. If we hook up even now, we talk back about that day in business studies when we were 15, where he ended up getting sent out into a load of trouble for something that wasn't even down to him at all. But chances are, every single one of you have got a story about a friend who when you look back on, you kind of say about them, they were a brilliant friend. Like, the components that they had and the attributes that they carried to be your friend was just outstanding. I mean, like they were fiercely loyal. They would be the first to jump into a fight with you and defend you, even if you were in the wrong. Like there's probably somebody, even for those of you that think, you know what, I don't have loads of friends. I bet you there's somebody that you can think back on in life and just go, man, they were, they were such a brilliant friend. And you know the same thing that I know, that when you're surrounded by brilliant friends, your life is easier. And yet the same is true in reverse as well. When you're surrounded with the wrong people, when you're surrounded with a bunch of people that you think are your friends and they're actually not, life gets stressy, life gets hard. In fact, one of the biggest single most causes of stress and anxiety and tension are when it goes wrong relationally within your friendship groups and within your friendship circles. And you know this whether it's in person or whether it's on the ground and on social media, when life gets hard for you, chances are it's because there is a friend or an old friend connected at the end of that hardship. And what we all know is this, that to have a friend, to have a group of friends can make all the difference in your life and in mine too. And it doesn't really matter how big or how large the group of friends that you have, what really matters is the quality of the friends that you have. So you don't need 10 friends, but what we all need is at least one friend who is just fiercely loyal and your best confidant, like somebody that you feel like they make you better at life and you make them better at life. We all know what it's like to value friendship like that. The type of friendship where you feel like you can just be yourself. The type of friendship like when you're around them, you just fit in and you don't even have to try. Like they find you funny, you're funny, when the reality is you both know none of you are even funny. But when you're around them, it just feels like, man, we, we just get on, we click. Like life is good when you're with your friends. What's fascinating to me is that Jesus knew all about this too. In fact, Jesus knew all about this so much that he spoke directly into this issue. Jesus knew about this so much so that there are portions of Scripture that are directed specifically towards the way in which we should do friendships, the way in which we should determine who we run with in life. Even Jesus speaks about this, which is kind of funny to me because a lot of people can sometimes mistakenly think that Christianity is about a bunch of stuff that actually it's not about at all. And what you find when you read the Scriptures, these ancient documents that have been passed down from generation to generation, what you find is what's contained within them is so much wisdom, practical insight as to how you can do your friendships better because Jesus thought that this was vastly important that we learn the art of doing it well. So in John 13, and I'm gonna read to you this small passage of Scripture, Jesus highlights the significance and the importance of friendship, where in essence, He's saying, you've gotta to learn to walk this way. He's kind of saying, look, I don't want you to think that friendship is like a non-church or non-Christian related thing. Friendship is way high on my agenda and you've gotta know how to do it. It's that important. And He says this, John 13, verse 34, He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, by what? By the way in which you love one another, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is just incredible here because Jesus 
is now pointing out to us something that is so key and significant that if we miss it, we miss out on so much. He's saying, hey guys, listen, you think that people will know that you follow me for a whole bunch of reasons that don't even count. And what he's actually highlighting is this idea that people will really know those that follow me by the way that they interact with their friendship groups, by the way that they do their relational life together. They were saying that Jesus was pointing out here. He was saying, look, you've got to know, nobody will ever know that you're a follower of mine. Nobody will ever know that you're a Christian by your accomplishments, by your exam success. Nobody will know that you're a follower of Jesus by the significance of your church buildings, your facilities, your structures, not your music, not your ministry. He was saying the bottom line is this, if you really want people to see that you follow me, then they're going to look at your friendship groups. They're going to look at the way in which you do life together. They're gonna look at the way in which you receive friends and are a friend. It's that big of a deal. Now, the funny thing is, is that having friends is something that we all want, but we all understand that there are many benefits of having friends too. And don't worry, I don't want to freak anybody out by thinking that this is going to be a message entitled Friends with Benefits, although I did consider it until my kids told me that that would be highly inappropriate. So the reality of it is, is we're going to talk about three really quick, significant benefits of just having the right kind of people in your life so that you understand that the reason why I want to talk about this is not because I just think that this is good subject matter or this is a great way to fill the next sort of 17, 18 minutes that I've got with you. It's so that you can understand that if you follow Christ, this is a really big deal. And here's the great news too. Even if you don't yet follow Jesus, like you're maybe just checking church out online or listening to this somewhere else, and you're just thinking like, I don't know what to make about this. At least you too can know the benefits of the reasons why we say being a good friend and having good friends are so vitally important for you too. The first thing is this. The first benefit of having friends means that you will grow spiritually. Like if you want to experience spiritual growth, if you want to mature in your Christian faith, it's gonna take people to do that. And I know that some of you like to think that you're so self-sufficient that you would never need anybody else to do anything for you in your life. Actually, it's just not true. Because what is true is that you can find Jesus on your own, but you absolutely can't follow Him on your own. Like you can find Jesus all on your own in isolation, but the idea of becoming more like Jesus and becoming a disciple of His, becoming a follower of His, doing all of that completely on your own, next to near impossible. What is true is that if you wanna grow in your Christian faith, it's gonna take some people around you, the right types of people that are gonna help facilitate that. And even Paul, and he was an author in the New Testament, he wrote, pretty much most of it. In Romans 1, even he writes and notes this. And he says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So when Paul is writing to a bunch of guys that follow Jesus, he's saying you've got to understand that you and I are mutually beneficial to one another because we're going to learn the art of encouraging each other in our faith. So there's one benefit of having the right group of friends in your life. You're going to grow spiritually. The second benefit is that you will experience emotional support. Like when you've got the right people around you, it seems to somehow make life go a little bit more easily. It will feel for you like when you've got the right group of people around you, it'll make you feel like life will make sense because the highs are even higher and the lows are nowhere near as low. In fact, Scripture talks in excess of 50 times about this whole idea about how you've got to love one another. Like Jesus was saying, this is a big deal, guys. If you say you follow me, you've got to learn the art of demonstrating and outworking that love for one another. Because without it, you're never going to be supported through the storms and the difficulties and the trials that life is going to bring you. In fact, Galatians 6, this is Paul writing again. And I know that this might feel a little shotgun with the Scriptures today, which is a little bit different for me. But I want to almost like give you some qualifications, some scriptures that will qualify the reason why I think this subject matter is so imperative for us to understand. Because he writes this, carry each other's burdens 
and in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, he's saying this, you know when you're there for one another to support each other through the hard times and the high and the low times, do you know that actually when you're doing that, you're pleasing to Christ? And isn't that consistent with what Jesus even says? Hey guys, you know, if you follow me, then people are gonna know that you follow me because of the way that you are with each other. But then a really interesting thought is this. One of the main benefits that I think that having the right people in your life is so imperative and so important is that even science, not even scripture, but science points towards the fact that when you live life with friends, you're gonna live longer. Isn't that a crazy idea? Like science supports the idea that when you choose not to live life on your own, being lonely, in isolation, that friends may even have the ability to extend your life. Like people who have strong social circles and who are relationally strong are far less likely to die prematurely than people who are lonely and isolated. There right now is the best reason that you can have or be told about the idea of making sure that you run your life with the right people. Friends help you keep a healthy mind. Another scientific fact would say, and it came out of a study that was founded in 2012 that basically says that people's risk of dementia increased when their feelings of loneliness increased. In other words, there are physical benefits for you having friends in your life. There are physical benefits for you being a good friend to somebody else in your life. But what's difficult for me, and maybe this is difficult for you, is the idea of having friends is the easy part, right? I mean, the idea that we all want to have close friends, close mates, close people that we get to do life with, we all can buy into that. But what's really difficult is understanding exactly and specifically, well, how do we even do that? Like, how do you build good, healthy, strong, lasting friendships? Because maybe this is not a dark art. Maybe there are some really practical things that we can all do to help facilitate this in all of our lives. How do you build healthy friendships? Well, in Luke 6, 31, and this is my main bedrock of Scripture, this is the main takeaway point that I want every single one of you to kind of walk away feeling and knowing today. Because for me, the idea of watching church online If it doesn't make sense to you, I feel like we've not done our job. If you ever come to Liverpool One Church and you feel like I didn't really understand that or there's nothing in that talk that I can take away and apply it to my life this week, I feel like we're failing and we're not doing our job. So I want us to really look at something that we're instructed to do in Luke 6 that will really help facilitate you having good friends and you being a good friend. And this is what it says, Luke 6, 31. It says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. So what are the things that we ought to be doing? If we're supposed to be doing to a load of other people so that we experience what we want in return, what is it? Like break that down. What are we supposed to be doing? So I wanna give you five rules of friendship. These are like the five laws of friendship. So if you feel like, man, I I want more friends. Maybe you do feel lonely. Maybe you do feel isolated and you're like, "I, I want there to be more people in my life who are dependable, who are there for me and I can be there for them. And you're like, I want more friends. Or Maybe you feel like, yeah, I've got a good friendship circle right now and I feel relationally strong, but but you know that it can be better than it really is. Here are the five laws of friendship. Here are the five rules that you've got to abide by if you want good friends and if you want to be a good friend. Number one, if you want to be a good friend and if you want to have good friends in your life, you've got to turn up. It means you've got to be present. It means if you want to experience the joy, the blessing, the benefit of having good friends in your life, it means that you've got to turn up for them. Even at times, if it feels like it may be somewhat of an inconvenience for you, it means that you've got to be present. You've got to be willing to engage in the friendship. Very practically, what does that look like? Well, 
when there's a birthday party on and we're not in lockdown 3.0, but when we're able to go out and you get in late from work and you feel like, I don't wanna be around anybody, I don't wanna socialise tonight, but it's that person who you're wanting friendship from, it's their birthday, it's their party, it's their dinner thing, it's their golf trip, it's their whatever it might be that you've had an invitation to be present at, you've gotta to choose to be present at. Even when you don't feel like going, when you don't feel like being a part of the group or the circle, when you don't feel like exerting your energy, if you wanna be a good friend, and if you wanna experience the joy and the blessing and the benefit of having good friends, it doesn't happen by mistake. It happens when you choose to be present. And when you choose to be present, you do it in a really non-awkward way. In other words, you've gotta intentionally choose to not be that guy that only turns up when you've got a great big need going on in your life. Because hey, if we're really honest, everybody knows someone like that. Like they'll call you, they'll text you when they're going through yet another drama or another crisis or another thing that they've got going on and now they're wanting to lean in and ask your advice yet again, even though you told them the same thing just a few months ago and you've not heard from them since. It's kind of like, no, no, don't be the awkward guy, like be present. Even when you don't feel like being present, then turn up. Because the best way for you to ever show somebody else that they have your support, it's by showing up. It's by turning up. It's by being present. But then the second rule of friendship, if you wanna be a good friend and if you wanna have good friends, is that you've got to be trustworthy. Trust counts for everything. You've gotta be trustworthy. In fact, the difference between an acquaintance and a friend is trust. Because the bottom line is, chances are you don't trust your Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat friend that you've never met that lives on the other side of the world, right? You might know of them, you might correspond with them infrequently, but I bet you don't trust them. But like your friend that maybe you've known for a six months or a year now, you're doing life together with them, maybe sharing family meals, holidays, being around each other, you're gonna trust them. But trust doesn't happen by mistake. In fact, if you want to be a good friend and have good friends, you're gonna have to show yourself to be trustworthy. And this is how you do that. Firstly, you've gotta be consistent. If you want people to look at you in your life and say they are trustworthy, you've got to be consistent. Like, don't be the up and down guy. You know, like one time you see them, they're like, they're on the top of the mountain, everything's great, life's amazing. But then the next day, one small, seemingly insignificant thing has happened and then they're rock bottom. And then the next day, they're on the top of the world again and then the day after, they're just rock bottom. And it's kind of like you feel that your relational life with them is like a roller coaster. That doesn't build trust. What builds trust is consistency. Because friendship, it needs reliability. It needs you to be pretty balanced when it comes to your mood and your character and your persona. It means like if you wanna be found to be trustworthy, that people know the you and the version of you that they're gonna get when you come round to the house or when you meet at the restaurant or when you go to the party. They wanna know what version of you are we gonna get? And when you're reliable and you're consistent, it builds trust. But the second part of proving yourself to be trustworthy is loyalty. In fact, Proverbs 17, 17, it nails it. It says it like this, that a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. You know, one of the best ways that you can grow and develop and nurture loyalty and friendship is by being with one another through thick and thin. Almost like that sense of, I am with you, come rail, rain, hail or shine. Rail? That'll end up on a meme somewhere, I'm sure. But the bottom line is, is if, if you wanna show yourself to be trustworthy, then it happens as a result of consistency and loyalty. And then finally, you've gotta be a good confidant. Like you've gotta be somebody, the type of person that if somebody else shares a secret with you, like something that maybe they've been mulling over in their mind, they've had way down in their heart, maybe it's about a dream, maybe it's about a desire, maybe it's about something that they've never spoken with anybody else with about ever. They wanna know that if they're gonna be willing to take a chance and expose that part of their world to you, they want to know 
that you're not gonna run around and be like a loose cannon with that precious information that they've passed to you. They wanna know that what they confide in you is not gonna end up on the ground or end up as the main topic of conversation at the next time that a bunch of you have gathered together. If you want to build trust, you've gotta be trustworthy with the confidential matters that come your way. In fact, Proverbs 11 says it like this. A gossip betrays confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. So can you keep a secret? Can you be trustworthy with somebody else's most precious thoughts and precious ideas? Because if you can, you're on your way to being a really great and solid friend. But the third rule of friendship is you've got to learn to be a better listener. I don't want to be the guy that brings to you a news flash right now, but chances are, maybe no one's ever told you this, but, but life is not always all about you. I mean, I know that your life is all about you, but in terms of like the world, the planet, the entire universe, it doesn't spin around you. And if you wanna be a good friend, and if you wanna have good friends, what that's really gonna look like practically is at times you're gonna have to speak a little less and listen a little more. James, the brother of Jesus, he writes about this. He says this, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, it means all of us that follow Jesus, we should be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry, quick to listen. In other words, that if you were trying to prioritise what's most important in the way in which you communicate with your friends, you should be the best listener. You should be the one asking the question, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you getting on with that health thing? Hey, I heard you had doctor's tests going on this week and and how are you about that? Hey, we spoke a couple of weeks back and you were telling me about all those difficulties that were happening in your place of work and what was happening in the business. Hey, how's that all going? Talk to me about that. It means, hey, I know that you've got that battle that you're fighting with your son or your daughter and man, that that must be incredibly difficult for you to work your way through. How is that going for you? Like you've got to be a better listener than you are a talker. Why? Because the world is not always about you. And if you wanna be a good friend and if you wanna experience the joy, the blessing, the benefit of having good friends, then it means that you've gotta be and become a better listener. The fourth rule of friendship is you've got to accept people's faults because nobody is perfect. Oh, and by the way, that includes me and you too. Like if you want to be a good friend, you've got to be willing to accept people's faults. Like in the areas of life where they're failing, in the areas of life where they let you down, in the areas of life where you feel like they've let you down so much and they haven't lived up to the expectations that you've got, you've got for them, you've got to be willing to accept their faults. I love what Paul writes in Romans 15. He says, oh, by the way, just so you know, guys, uh, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Paul here is, he's just spelling it out for us. He's saying like, don't apply a higher level for people in your world that even Jesus Christ, that our heavenly Father in heaven does not apply to you. He's saying in the same way, that you are accepted by God with your faults, with your failures. You've got to be willing to accept people and their faults and their failures also. Like, don't be, don't be too specific. I mean, sure, aim high, expect the world, expect a lot, but like, don't allow there to be no margin or zero margin for somebody to make a mistake or say something that upsets you or says something to somebody else and you feel like it's really out of turn. Like don't major on minor things. Be willing to be gracious and accept people's faults. You know, and sometimes you've just gotta be willing to to accept the fault and overlook the failure so that you can really see the good that God has placed within them. You know, for those of you who are married, I bet that you'll know this tension is real, right? Because um, uh, Emma, my wife, we have these kind of conversations sometimes and she'll just kind of pipe up and typically it's more her than me, but we were watching Netflix the other night and um, I have this habit, right? Which is whenever I'm just doing whatever, chilling out, I kind of, I tap my fingers. It doesn't matter where I am, even if I'm working on a desk, whatever, I tap my fingers. Like I always have, like I grew up and when I was a small child, I'd play some drums sometimes and I'd just, I'd tra- tra- tap my fingers and I'd be doing it all the time. And Emma just turns around the other day and she goes like, will you just stop 
tapping your fingers. And I'm like looking at her, I'm going like, huh? Like, I've been doing this for 20 years and you know this, like, this ain't changing now. And she's going, well, you just stop doing that tappy thing with your fingers. And I'm saying, hon, look, you're never going to change me doing that now. You have got zero chance. It's a habit. It's a thing. I've done it for most of my life. My teachers in school couldn't get me to stop tapping and drumming with pens and on tabletops. So you've got no chance. Like I've been told to stop tapping since I was about eight years of age and no one's ever been able to get me to stop doing it. And she's like, well, you know, I just find it a bit annoying. And I was like, hon, We've been married for like 16 years. You know, we've been like known each other. We've been friends. We've been dating for probably close to 20. Like you've never brought this up before. And she's like, well, I just wanted you to know. It it really annoys me when you tap your fingers. I'm like, well, it ain't gonna change. You're just gonna have to accept me for who I am. And then I turned around and I said to her, "And, and is there anything else you wanna tell me about that you don't like whilst we're having this conversation? And she just looks at me and she scowls and she goes, yeah. The way you tie your shoelaces is ridiculous. And I'm going, well, hang on a second. Like there's a problem here with the way in which I tie my shoelaces. Like this is a thing. And I'm like going, we couldn't have spoken about this earlier. Like this is a genuine problem. I'm going, on. I've tied my shoelaces the same way. Since I've been able to tie shoelaces, you're just gonna have to accept me now for who I am because that ain't ever going to change. And I think that I say all of that in a joking way, but this truth is serious. Like sometimes inadvertently we do it without even realising we are. We have an expectation on somebody else that they should change and become a way that is more pleasing to us when the reality of it is maybe the real onus is on us to accept them with their faults and their flaws than it is us demanding them to change. Because chances are there's just some things that are really evident that you're never gonna change with that guy or that girl or that friendship circle, that husband, that wife. It's just maybe not going to change. But then the fifth and final thing that you've got to do, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, and it's perhaps the hardest thing to do, that if you want to be a good friend and if you want to experience the blessing of having good friends in your world, you've got to learn the art of celebrating the wins and sharing the losses. Like you've got to learn the art of being able to do what Paul encourages to do in Romans 12, 15, where he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those that mourn. Like if you wanna really be a good friend, what that means, how that outworks is that on the day that, and we could pick a thousand examples, but on the day that they get a new house and you've been praying that you would just have a house, you celebrate that like you've just won the lottery and you've just got the house. It means that, when they've just got the baby and really you desperately wanna have a baby and you know, you're trying to find ways to celebrate that, but it's hard because you feel like what God's blessing them with is what you earnestly want. Well, if you wanna be a good friend, it means that you go, man, I'm so so glad that you've got the very thing that we haven't got yet, but we're praying for you and we're blessing you because we wanna celebrate in your win. I might not feel like I'm winning right now, but thank God that you're winning. You know what it looks like when somebody gets the job that you wanted, when somebody gets the promotion that you felt that you should have had, but missed out on the opportunity of getting? A good friend goes, hey, congratulations. I am so delighted that you got the job. And you might not feel like you're winning, but thank God that someone's winning. Thank God that your friend is winning. And you might not be experiencing the thing that you earnestly dream of, desire of, want in your heart, but thank God that someone else is. Maybe you want the car and you haven't got the car. Well, thank God that they've got the car. Maybe you wanted the girl and they got the girl. Well, hey, thank God that they got the girl because God's got the perfect girl just for you, maybe just around the corner. If you just keep willing to keep going and get around the corner with a good heart and a healthy attitude about you, learn the art of celebrating the wins and then turning up and being present when you share in one another's losses. Like some of our closest times of friendships really being formed have been in the most difficult and stressful sets of circumstances imaginable. I mean, like it's in those times of difficulty and adversity that it'll feel to you when your friends turn up like these are good friends. And that's what Paul was saying. He was like, look, you've got to be willing to celebrate the win and share in the losses. Because you know, when you do that, it makes the times of joy feel way more joyful. And the times of sorrow feel like they've been cut in half. 
And this might be really practical, but my hope and prayer for us as Liverpool One Church family is that this year we would master the art of friendship like never before. In fact, Liverpool One, I challenge you to not just be a hearer of the Word, but be a doer. Like in this next week, I am challenging you to practically live out these five rules of friendship. Figure out ways, get creative, talk about it with your spouse, maybe try and do something for another group of friends or whatever it is, or that guy in your office. Like you be this. Don't just be aware of what it takes to be a good friend. Be a good friend, cultivate a life of friendship, build a healthy habit of being around those that are close to you and develop and grow and nurture deep and meaningful relationships by doing these five simple things. Because as you do that, and this is so significant, because as you do that, people who don't know Jesus and God's love. People who have never heard of the Gospel story will look upon your relational lives and your friendships and the way in which you interact with one another and through their ability to see how you are with other people and other people are with you, they will see Jesus in that. Like way more than they'll see Jesus sometimes at a church or sometimes in the melee of the music of a worship song like way more in doing this or doing that, they will see Jesus in you because of the way that you are a good friend to those in your world and the way in which your friends are a good friend to you. So church family, I challenge you in this coming week, let's put these five rules of friendship to practice because actually way more important for us than building a church here I wanna build a community of believers. That means we're committed to doing life with one another through thick and through thin, when it's hard and when it's easy, when the sun's shining and when the rain's pouring, we're committed to one another to be a good friend. And what we expect in return is good friendship all the way back because it is a sign of spiritual maturity when you choose to apply these five rules of friendship. So for each and every one of you, time has gone. I would love the opportunity right now to pray for us all as a church family so that we would truly learn the art of really living this out. So wherever you are, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes for a real short moment. And let me just pray for you. Father in heaven, we know and we can see that the way in which we interact with people is so important because you spoke about this. But Lord, you also know that we find it most difficult. And whilst on one hand, our friends can be the biggest blessing. And to our friends, we can be the biggest blessing. When everything's great, but God, when it's hard, I mean, it feels wrong and it feels abrasive. You know of how stressy that becomes, how anxious we become, how difficult that really makes us feel. So Lord, I pray that in this coming week, that we would learn the art of applying these rules of friendship so that in doing so, we would truly represent you well in our life, that we would follow you well, that we would represent you well to those in our families, our friendship circles, our colleagues, at the places where we go and socialise, that God, that people would see you through the way in which we interact with others. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Church, even at home, why don't we worship together?
He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. My all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What a service, right? I don't know about you, but I just find that word from Luke just so encouraging and so challenging. And hey, I'll definitely be picking up that challenge 
this week to pick up those five points that he was talking about. But hey, great service, right? Amazing. And hey, church, we've come to that point of our service where we get to give of our yeah. finances and all the ways that you can do that on the screen below. But church, we are so thankful for your generosity. We are so thankful for your giving in this season. And we couldn't and wouldn't want to do this without you. But hey, I'm so thankful that as a family, we get to yeah. financially contribute to the church here. The work that is going on because hey, it pours so much into us. It makes us better at life. We have family, we have friends. This is a place called home. So we are so thankful and honoured that we can give of our finances. So hey, as you give today, have an honoured heart and be thankful that we get this opportunity. So, so good. And hey, time is gone, but this week is looking really good. What's coming up it this is. week? It is. Hey, on Thursday, you girls, how much have you missed Braveheart? Come on. We've got Emma jumping on Instagram Live, so you don't want to miss that Thursday evening. And then on Sunday, we have a special guest, Aaron Cole. He's going to be tuning in. He's going to bring in the word next Sunday, so you cannot miss it. It's going to be absolutely epic. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I'm excited. Hey guys, have a great week. Stay safe and we'll see you next Sunday.